Okay, so we're going to do uh, start from ayah number 8, insha'Allah, in Surah uh, Fatir. Um, so, if, if we do a quick uh, recap of, uh, of what we've kind of looked into, or what the Surah has talked about uh, so far, uh, you'll find, uh, as I said, it's the third Surah in the cluster from Ahzab to, uh, to Zumar. And the first two had different uh, approaches of the concept of submission and obedience and, and uh, ta'a of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Islam or Islam. And Surah Fatir is the one that's going to talk about the concept with a bit more depth. I mean, it's not going to give uh, as many examples. It's not going to talk about incidents, just like uh, Surah Al-Ahzab or Sabah did. Because they talked about incidents. Uh, Surah Al-Ahzab talked about incidents within the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Sabah talked about incidents that happened, uh, you know, quite uh, a while back. You're not going to find many uh, uh, stories in, uh, in, in Surah uh, Fatir. Surah Fatir is almost uh, storyless uh, surah. It's kind of and it's kind of uh, rare to be honest. Uh, there's not many surahs in the Quran that are of the length of Fatir. So if you look at the, it, is, it's, um, it creeps up on around six pages. Uh, it, it's, it's rare for a six-page surah to have almost no stories uh, within it. That's quite uh, 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 rare in the Quran. Again, these are little things you'll pick up on when you're looking at surahs and you're comparing things. So they don't have many many, many stories because. Of, uh, Surah Fatir is not trying to give examples or talk. It's, just, it's going to talk about the concept of submission um, methodolo methodologically, or you look at it from a, um, a, a grand perspective. It's going to talk about uh, who you're submitting to, why you're submitting, how that happens, what the obstacles are, what the difficult with the difficulties, how it ends up, you know the reasons for achieving it. So this is what Surah Fatir is going to do. And so it's a very deep surah in that sense, and there's a lot of benefit in understanding it. Uh, a lot, and it's very beautiful to read as well. Um, so how it started out right, but was by talking. About, uh, talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the first three or four verses were just or the three at least uh, or the first uh, two verses uh, were, were kind of selling the point that this is who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about him subhanahu wa ta'ala with his great uh, you know um, attributes and his names with Aziz al-Hakim talking the fact that if, if he gives a mercy then no one can withhold it and if he withholds it then no one can give it these are things that this is why you should this is who you're submitting to you're not submitting to anyone uh, which is which is an important point as a, as a human being you don't give up your your free will to anyone so only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the reason is because he has all this because this, this is who he is subhanahu wa ta'ala and then after that we had two um uh, uh, two commands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhal nas, O people, and talk to people in general of all backgrounds, of all faiths, and all uh, 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 beliefs. Uh, he, he, and He gave two, uh, two commands. The first command was, Udhkuru ni'mat Allahi alaykum, recall the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. So it was focused on uh, the concept of gratitude. And the second one was a bit different. Inna wa'ad Allahi haqq fala tagurrannakum al hayatu dunya. That indeed the promise of Allah, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the truth. So do not be uh, deluded. Do not be uh, misguided. Don't be fooled by the worldly life. Don't be fooled by it. So two things uh, you were commanded at the beginning. And, and, I, and we didn't really talk about them. I, I explained the verses, but I didn't take time to kind of talk about them together, which, I'll, which, what, what I'm going to do, which is what I'm going to do today, uh, for a bit at least. Is that uh, these two uh, commands, when you put them together, being grateful, um, and, and, and gra being grateful is not as simple as just uh, just pu putting it like that. It's a, you're just grateful for things. No, it's it's a it's a way of uh, it's a way of thought. It's it's a perspective that you, you either you have or you don't about literally everything that goes on in your life. Are you someone who feels uh, privileged to be to be what just no just to be? Do you pr feel privileged that you are? You say well, are what? No, no. J just are. Do you feel privileged or not? It's a way of life. It's just a way of thinking. Do you? Is that your perspective or is it not? Uh, or do you feel that in order for you to achieve a certain level of happiness or to start feeling grateful, there's a there's a long list of, of standards that need to be met so that you can f uh, feel happy? Or are you someone who just based on the simple package of just being alive? You, you think this is something worthy of being grateful for. You understand the difference? This, this, it's, it's a way of looking at things uh, that you either you, you, uh, you obtain in life or you, or you really don't obtain in life. And there's really no midway here. Um, so that's what Udhkur Ni'matullahi Alaikum. Always remind yourself of the blessing of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Which ones? Anyone. And he gave two basic ones. Halim Khaliqin, the fact that he created you. Yarzukukum min as-samawati wal ard. And he provides for you. Those two, just remind yourself of those every day that you were created and you were provided for. You know, be very, very uh, happy. In the midst of, uh, of a competitive uh, life system, you know, social, uh, financial, um, uh, uh, yeah, professional, educational system that we live in, where everything is very, very competitive, it's easy to stop, uh, to stop feeling uh, grateful and, um, and privileged. 
and you can feel that uh, well, you, you, cause you, because in a competitive system you're always uh, comparing between you and, and others and there's always going to be a gap between you and those who are, who are 10 or 15 steps ahead or even one step ahead or two steps ahead. You feel that you know, there's this gap and why is there this gap? Well, and that can cause a lot of depression and can cause a lot of anxiety and can make people feel really, you know, feel worthless and, uh, and, and lose the, you know, the reason to, to get up in the morning. And, and the reason for that is just that we don't have a, a grateful perspective of life, a, a, gra a perspective of gratitude. That, you know, the fact that I'm here is a big deal. You know, uh, I could have easily not been. So this is great. You know, I, I can whatever khair I can do with this. This is you know a big deal. I'm, so that that makes a difference in how you uh, how you look at things. And and, that, and why is that important? Well, it's important when you put it with the second one. This is the beauty of these two. That's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "Ya yuhannas twice." He didn't give two commands in a row, uh, like in, in one. No, he called out twice and gave two commands just to say that these are two separate things. Uh, the, be the, the, the benefit of them is when you bring them, you know, when you bring them together. So that perspective, so you're, that's your outlook, that's how you see things. And the other one is not being fooled uh, by, by the worldly life, knowing that uh, there's more to this, pic this story than what meets the eye immediately. What you see right now is not the full picture. There's more to come. Don't be fooled by what seems to be very much uh, uh, intriguing or fun at this point, where you are right now, which is maybe wealth or um, you know, status or wh whatever it is that you feel that you, you, you have the ability to, to obtain that maybe you don't have right now or you wish you had. So if you put them both together, uh, this is how you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being grateful that you're here, not being fooled by what you're going to uh, deal with in your life as you move, uh, as you move forward. As you move forward, al gharur which is here, uh, uh, the one who wants to elude you or the one who wants to fool you uh, or show you things to be different what, than what their actual value uh, is, which is shaitan in, this, uh, in the context of, the, of these verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us. Um, with that, the, the promise of Allah, the promise of Allah is truthful, is righteous, meaning here that there's going to be the day of judgment after. So if you have gratitude for what you have right now, and you know that what's coming is a day of, uh, of, of uh, you know, extreme uh, meticulous judgment, you're going to be asked about everything that you were given, um, so you, sh you shouldn't be fooled by the little, or the small amount of, uh, of uh, possessions that you didn't get right now or that you feel that you weren't, you know, you weren't lucky enough to, uh, to obtain. You put them both together, this is how you end up being very, uh, able to submit. This is not the full uh, concept of submission, meaning submission is a, bigger, is a bigger idea, but you will not be able to achieve it if these two concepts aren't a part of who you are. If you're going to achieve, this is what you need. You need to be able to be grateful for everything you've got, no matter how little it is, or how under uh, this, uh, the standard of your personal feeling it is. Meaning, you may feel you, you deserve more, you want more, or you, you know, are, are trying to, uh, you're ambitious uh, to get more. So having that, and the fact that you're not fooled. We can't fool you with simple stuff, with, with money, or with status, or with anything at all. You're not, you're not going to be eluded by, by the simple stuff of dunya. If those two things are there, and they're separate, because you can be grateful, but still be fooled by, uh, by dunya. The, the, it, it, you can be grateful for what you have, but you're, always, you're fooled by dunya, and you always want more of it. And you always feel that this is something that is worthy of your time, worthy of your, uh, of, of, of your uh, effort, and worthy of your focus. Meaning, I, and you meet those people, this is the thing, that you can meet examples of that, of non-Muslims, uh, if, if you look around, living in the world, especially in this country. We have that uh, um, opportunity here in this country to see people from different ways of thought, you know, different ways of life. If, if, you, if you really look at things, if you're an observant uh, individual, and you kind of look around, and you, watch, and you kind of watch for, tre for trends and traits in people, you'll find that there are people who, are very, who, who seem to be very grateful, they're very, you know, they're very happy with what they have, but they don't believe in God at all. Why? Because they, they didn't get this last part. For that ghurrannakum wasn't a part of their, uh, of their equation. They are fooled by this dunya. They think this is the whole, there's nothing else, this is the picture. There's no beyond it. So they're always trying to get more, but they're happy with what they have. And they seem to, leave a, to lead a pretty decent life, right? And then you have the opposite. You have people who aren't grateful, uh, but they're not fooled also by, by dunya. Meaning those are the people who kind of don't really care whether they have a lot or not. I mean, they're not always trying to get more. They know it's all garbage. It's all just, uh, you know, it's just a, a hoax. It's all, you, you don't really find happiness in it. You don't really you know, get fulfillment through, uh, through possessions or anything. By the same time, they're not grateful for what they have. They're actually very, uh, um, yeah, they're, they're very uh, disgruntled towards existence. 
I mean, they're always feeling that this was, why is life and why did God do this and why not more and why not better? So they're not happy with what they have. And you see both, both uh, trends in this, especially in this community, very easily. It's, uh, it's all over the place. The Muslim, in order for, <coughs> and this is not submission, this is in order for you to submit, you need to have, to do, <laughs> have these two things. You have to be grateful for what you got. And you can't be fooled by, by, the, by what, you're, what surrounds you right now. You can't be fooled by the little stuff. Uh, by possessions and status and money and, and wealth and you can't be fooled by, uh, by by this life there's more to it there's more to it than what you just see right now the, the picture is, is, is much broader and there's a continuation that, that comes after, after death so if you, if you carry both then you're prepared um, to actually submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly but without them you can't so I think, I think it's worthy of noting uh, that uh, these, these two commands um, what are the percentage of Muslims who actually um, uh, follow them properly. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, if you were to look at the Muslim population, how many of us have both uh, clear, ha have a, have a perspective of, of gratitude? I'm not saying just uh, they say Alhamdulillah when you're at the ask. No, I'm an actual uh, inner uh, uh, feeling of, of gratefulness for everything that, that 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 they have in life, and they're not fooled. Meaning, the bigger picture is clear to them, and, and they don't value. They don't overvalue a dunya because al ghurur is when you're told that the value of something is more than it actually is, it's, and it's actually less than that. So you're just it's an illusion. You you get you're, you're eluded. So how many, if you were to take Muslims, do we all as Muslims all have these two concepts quite uh, you know clearly grasped? And this is what we're I I, I don't know I I you know I vote that we we don't really have that as much as we should. Even though they're very simple concepts that the Quran uh, teaches all through the uh, you know all, all through its verses almost all the time, um, <coughs> what you find was interesting in uh, uh, in the surahs of the Quran. I'm going to share this uh, general piece of information. Uh, remember ayah number seven, the last one we read. So it says, "Ladina kafaru lahum adabun The disbelievers uh, are awaiting them as a, a severe punishment. Waladina amanu amil salihati lahum maghfiratun wa ajrun kabir. And those who you know believe and do the deeds that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created them to do will find uh, forgiveness and a great reward. Well, isn't that obvious? Isn't it obvious? Yeah, it's totally obvious. So why is it here? What's the point of this ayah here? Don't you feel that the, uh, the surah would survive totally fine without it? I'm trying, what I'm try, are you getting what I'm trying to say? Now, if the, would the surah suffer without this uh, ayah? Because it's pretty clear. I mean, we all know that. Yeah, that's fine. But so you see, the, uh, uh, this, and this is why sometimes we think the Quran has repetitiveness in it, or, but it's not. It is each surah in the Quran, this is what happens. Each surah in the Quran, uh, it states its self-evident uh, concept separately. So each surah will come and say, these are the self-evident concepts we're going to use to, 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 to discuss the following topics. So that even if this, this self-evident concept, even this maxim, was something that is discussed elsewhere many times, if it's needed for this surah, uh, for the topic of the surah, it will repeat itself. Are you trying to, what I'm trying to say? It's like you're, you're arguing, it's like you're, you're studying a, uh, yeah, any, uh, an equation in math or a concept in physics. Before you go into the details, uh, at the beginning, the introduction of it, they'll have to state for you the basic uh, equations that everyone, you know these equations, but they have to state them, that, the, that our conclusion is drawn from the following you know, initial equations. So they'll use those self-evident uh, topics, and they may discard other self-evident stuff, because they're not really needed for the conclusion that we, that we have right here. And that's how the Quran works. Each surah is its own unit. So when it's going to draw conclusions, it's going to state the maxims that it needs to draw those conclusions. So it's not being repetitive. No, no. It's just making sure that these are the topics I need you to think about. You have to think about hamd. That's why the biggest surah began with that. The concept of gratitude has to be there for you, or else you're not going to be able to uh, understand the concept of the surah. You have to uh, understand Allah uh, certain descriptions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that existed at the beginning. We talked about. The first two commands, even though these two commands aren't unique, the way that they're uh, uh, given maybe is because it's Ya nas twice in a row, yeah. But the actual concepts, Uthkuru Ni'matullahi Alaikum, is that the first time, only time it's in the Quran? It's all over the Quran, it's everywhere. If you go, yeah, if you go to different surahs, it's almost everywhere. But no, uh, because it's a maxim you're going to need. It's, some, it's a self evident concept that you have to carry with you in order for the surah to make any sense. Um, uh, you're talking about uh, a consequence and reward is another maxim that the surah wants you to carry as we move forward or else if you don't have these maxims with you then you get lost well you can say well why doesn't the Quran just have you know, a self-evident concept once and then you use it everywhere well here's the point and here's a really interesting one that I think is worthy of sharing you see it's it, it, one of the worst things you can do is um, use uh, a certain ayah in another surah 
to force an explanation on an, uh, or an understanding on an ayah in a different surah. Sometimes we take one ayah in one surah and we try to use it to force an understanding upon another ayah in another surah where the understanding of that one was based on certain self-evident uh, concepts that that surah explained that this surah didn't. It didn't talk about them, it left them out purposefully so that this uh, ayah could be understood a bit differently. I understand what I'm trying to say? So when we cross-match like that almost open, uh, 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 blindly and um, uh, ignorantly, we end up mess messing things up. So if you go to Surah Tawbah, you'll find that Surah Tawbah has maxims in it. A bunch of self-evident concepts right at the beginning that will help you understand uh, ayat later in the middle when it talks about, you know, when it goes into the detail of war and it goes into the detail of, of sacrifice and fighting. So if you take those ayat and you don't understand them in the light, in, understand them in the light of the same, the self-evident concept of that surah, or you try to understand them in the light of ayat that exist in another surah, you're, you're messing everything up. Now you're just, now you're just making a salad. You're just, you're just putting, you don't know what you're doing anymore. And this is what happens. You can't, this cross-matching or this cross-evident based from one surah to the other, not understanding the purpose of each surah, is based on the fact that we don't understand it's a unit. Especially the long surahs. I'm not, maybe I'm not talking about the small ones. The small ones are very simple, maybe three, four words. Just, it's just giving you a little, we, we did use Amba, it just gives you a small pill of, yeah, just a small understanding, just a little concept for you to carry with you in your life. But the longer ones, no. The longer ones, they, 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 they bring their self-evident uh, 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 statements with them. Like each surah at the beginning will give you self -evident. these are the statements that we're, we're basing, our argument as we move forward on. And without these sta statements, the, the conclusions won't make sense, right? And without these statements, you won't, able to, you won't be able to have a proper discussion, and we don't need other statements for, this, uh, uh, for these conclusions. So when you start to try to force an another statement from the Qur'an on it, you end up mixing things, and you end up making, ma missing a lot of stuff and making a lot of mistakes. Did, that, did I make any sense here, or did I guys l lose you guys? This is a bit more of a, a general way of looking at the Qur'an that I'm interested in you understanding. And you, and you may come to your mind, well, in that case, I have to be very careful when I try to understand an ayah in light of another ayah from a different surah. Exactly. You do. You have to be very, very careful. You have to make sure that there are similars, similarities between these two surahs. You have to make sure that both surahs use similar, similar uh, self-evident statements. You have to understand that both surahs had a similar line of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of narrative that they were using. Because if they don't, then mixing and matching will bring something forward called Nasr. Um, Nasr uh, uh, is called abrogation. Is when one ayah literally removes the uh, the credibility of another one, saying that this this ayah over here doesn't apply anymore, and this one does. Now this is something uh, from a um, from an usul fiqh perspective. It's very difficult to talk about. There's a lot of difference of opinion upon it. I carry. I have a very uh, strict way of looking at it that I really don't uh, and I don't really tolerate other ways of looking at things uh, in it for, 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 for reasons that I'll explain in a moment um, if you go through the history of Islamic uh, law you will find that a lot of the groups uh, 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 the majority of it, they were they were okay with the concept of abrogation and the concept of it is not problematic because basically uh, the Quran abrogated uh, uh, the Injil and the Torah before and that's fine meaning when the final religion came it said the rest of the religions can uh, yeah, are no longer valid because uh, for, for clear reasons which is the loss of the authenticity of their books to begin with and the loss of the teachings but then we started using abrogation within the Quran that is recited we start to say that certain recited verses will abrogate other recited verses. And some scholars went to the point where they would use, say, two or three verses in the Qur'an, abrogate over 125 different chapters, not paragraphs, uh, not ayah, uh, paragraphs. So, which adds up to around maybe yeah, 200 uh, to 220 pages of the Qur'an that are completely uh, yeah, wiped out in terms of their, uh, of their effect and, and their benefit just by the claim of saying an ayah abrogated another ayah. Uh, for example, the very, very known, the ayah in Surah At-Tawbah, قَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَلَا بِالْيَوْمِ الْأَخْرِ Fight those who don't believe in Allah and the Day of Judgment in the continuation of the ayah. Instead of understanding that ayah within the, uh, the maxims and self-evident statements of Surah At-Tawbah, which is very clear, it's very, very simple. And Surah Tawbah is one of the easiest surahs to explain. No one likes to go through it because it's so long, but it's one of the easiest ones to explain. It's filled, filled with mercy. It's called Tawbah, you sheikh. It's called, uh, you know, repentance. Anyways, they take the ayah and they abrogate half the Qur'an with it. You tell them, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, subhanahu wa ta says, la ikra'ah fi'd-deen. There's no, you know, there's no, um, uh, 
what's the word for it? Uh, yeah, compulsion or, or yeah, in, uh, or, or coercion, right? Coercion as well. Coercion in religion, you say, well, that's, that was abrogated by this eye. And then you, you start giving all the verses that talk about people having freedom of choice, and they say, abrogated, abrogated, abrogated. <laughs> well, why? Well, because of this, this lack of understanding of how the things work. Each surah has a bunch of self-evident statements that it puts at the beginning that you're going to need to understand the conclusion it draws. Conclusions it draws. So that's why Surah Fatiha says, الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ شَرِيدٌ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا عَمِّلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَجُرٌ كَبِيرٌ You'll say that's, everyone knows that. Why is that here? It's, it's a self-evident statement that you need in order for the rest of the Surah to make sense. You have, that has to be something on your radar. It's like it's giving you all the, all the little uh, um, basic equations, all the basic understandings. This equals this, this means this. Now, okay, based on these, this is, these are all the conclusions you're going to draw. And every Surah does that, especially the long ones. All of them do that. And I always talk about that here, that the introduction of the surah brings forward five to six different concepts, and then it starts going, why? Because those concepts you're going to need. Without those concepts, you can't understand the surah. And when we start cross-mixing, well, this ayah says this, and from a different surah, well, these aren't necessarily talking about the same thing to begin with. So, you're, so you, you don't understand that this self-evident statement doesn't exist in that surah, because that surah is not talking about it specifically. It's disregarding it right now to, to, to argue a different concept altogether. This, is, this may be a bit advanced or maybe a bit uh, confusing, but this is how the Qur'an is supposed to be looked at. Look, looked at. So those who stand up and start you know, bringing forward a lot of uh, um, either, either magical thinking or very weird ways of looking at this stuff, and you're like, I'm sure this is not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Well, it's usually because of that. Usually because they don't know how to navigate uh, within the Qur'an itself. They're not sure how to go by things. So it's not repetitiveness. The Qur'an is not repeating itself. This ayah is not just there uh, because Allah had nothing else to say. It was just an adi addition. No, no. Very important verse in the surah. And, I'm, I'm, and I always use it as an example. You're going to see as we move through its fatr, this ayah is going to be an important one. The concept of consequence, whether uh, you know, punishment or reward, having that as a self-evident concept that's there is going to be of, of, of extreme importance. So this whole argument is from dealing with each surah as is like a split unit. Um, as a unit. It doesn't have to be, have to be, we don't have to use the word separate or split, yeah. but it's as a unit. As a unit. Yeah. Is there like any evidence from like, whether the Hayaf, Sahaba? <laughs> well, why is it a surah? <laughs> What's the benefit of, yeah. So, when the revelation happened, yeah. the Quran was like surahs, right? No, so that's not always how it was. So sometimes you would just get a bunch of verses. And the Prophet ﷺ would specifically tell them, place it here. Place it after that ayah of this surah and be for this one. And sometimes the Sahaba would have to, like, uh, like a puzzle piece, stick it there. Meaning this ayah was revealed, and then this ayah was revealed, and the one between were revealed later. And they would have to place them, that this was going to ayah after this, and before this. And they would put the surah together sometimes, especially, especially the long ones and uh, the Madani ones, especially the long Madani ones, especially those. It took a long time, because they were revealed through, through you know, years and years of... Uh, and Mecca surahs weren't as, as, uh, as spread out, uh, but we do know, f for, for a fact, for example, that Surah Muzammil, the first 19 ayahs came out once and the last one came later. So, just the message we're taking from this. Yeah. So, there are specific units. If you want to compare or do any yeah. abrogation, make yeah. sure that the premise for each surah kind of is similar. This, is similar. So it, or, yeah, yeah. Make any kind exactly. Of exactly. Uh, some surahs are very specific to context, and some of them are very, very general. General. So, Tfalta is a general surah. Why? Because it doesn't talk about stories and doesn't give examples of his life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or anyone else's. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? The moment s stories enter, stories are context. Stories are context. It's a scenario. Right? It's giving you a scenario. Now you have context for, the, for, for what we're teaching you. You have a surah that has no s scenarios in it. It's just, you know, one uh, command and one concept of the other. You know this is more generalized. Yes? Uh, what about the order of revelation? Like, uh, Good. So when, it, when it, of course, abrogation is a huge co uh, topic. It takes like uh, when you study usul fiqh, a good ten percent of time you will spend studying usul fiqh will just be on abrogation itself, uh, because of how controversial and difficult it is to understand and to actually go into detail. The thing is, we don't know for sure. This is the point. Uh, we do not know with full certainty um, which ayah was revealed before which ayah. We don't really know for sure. What we do know for sure is that everything that is Mecki was revealed before everything that is Madani. That's, we know that for sure. But everything else is controversial. Like we have a high probability of this surah coming before this one. 
for, for example, I can, uh, with, with, you know, with, with, with not 100% certainty, but with some level of degree of confidence, I can tell you that Surah Al-Baqarah was before Surah Al-Tawbah in Revelation, with some degree of confidence, based on a lot of uh, yeah, any, uh, attributes and aspects of both surahs that will make me, give me the ability to actually uh, to say that. Uh, however, the last verse in the Quran was in Surah Al-Baqarah. <laughs> The last ayah ever to be revealed, the last one, uh, in Surah Al Baqarah. So, uh, for, I, for us to use uh, uh, timing as evidence for abrogation is a very weak argument that falls to pieces once, uh, once critically yani, uh, appraised and, 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 and spoken of yani, and argued. Uh, y y the discussion is, is very, very weak. So, you need other things that add to that. Again, abrogation just, is not just based on, on timing, it's, there's more to it than that. Um, but I'll tell you how you should understand it. That whatever was abrogated, was abrogated during the life of the Prophet ﷺ and didn't make its way into the Qur'an. Meaning it was abrogated both in concept and recitation. And this is the, uh, the, the opinion that I, that I carry that I think, and I really don't... Uh, uh, I accept. I understand people see it differently. That's fine, but but I don't accept it. I think it's wrong. Like uh, I'll tell you, sometimes there's two opinions. You can take either. Uh, I, I I like one, but the other one's fine. I'm telling you, there's two opinions, and the one is wrong. That's totally wrong. <laughs> That's totally wrong. That opinion. For for a number of reasons, it's actually very dangerous. It's very. Da you're giving someone the ability to take the word of God and say it doesn't count. That is. I I can't do that. I don't know. Maybe some people have the ability. You know, have the have the guts to say that. I don't. If he said it, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to live by it. I don't care uh, whether you, you... For you to say it's abrogated, even if you say it's abrogated by another word of God, for you to say that something he said doesn't count is way beyond my, 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 yeah, I mean, my comfort level to ever say about anything that I actually have in my hands. So I believe whatever was abrogated, and there are things that were abrogated, they didn't make their way into the Qur'an. I mean, they're not here. Uh, they were taken out of the surah by the Prophet so I said the Sahaba, this doesn't count anymore, it's out, yes. Is that part of uh, man's humanity? No? Exactly, that, and, and, that, and, that, and that's the opinion that I carry, and I think if you look at it another way, you're opening the door for failure, you're going to fail. If you walk, because if you take the logical, uh, if you take the logical consequences of, uh, of uh, looking at it differently, you're going to hit a lot of walls, and you're going to you're going to figure out that I, this doesn't work, I have to go back. Maybe, maybe nothing in the Quran is abrogated, and then you're like, all right, this works way better. Actually understand, because now you start, you're forced to understand surahs, and you're, sp you're forced to look at the surah as a unit, you're forced to look at its self-evident concepts, you're forced to understand its context and its timing, and you start understanding things. You actually start understanding the, dyna the dynamic nature of what you're reading, and it, doesn't be and it becomes much more colorful and much more deep. However, when you, when you abrogate, you, you just, it, it's, a one, it's a very closed-minded narrative that, it usually, it usually those who, who ar argue for this are uh, those who, have a very clear agenda. Very clear agenda. Like, very clear. Before you even talk about the Quran with them, you know what they're thinking. Yeah, and either, either they're, you know, in my, in my experience of talking about it, they're either, they're either extremely, you know, you know, they're what they call today terrorists, I mean, people who are, you know, are bloody, or, they, or they're politically, uh, yeah, driven for a specific rule, uh, you know, for a specific gain. They want something to be this way. And this helps them, you know, push their idea forward. So abrogating certain parts and keeping other parts works for them. But I, I, again, if you open the door for, for people to start pointing at verses and say these verses don't count, where does it end? Who gets to, who gets to, or we just say, no, no, everything we have here is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to find a place for it to be uh, practice with, and it's all it's very possible. It's not very possible, it's very easy actually. <laughs> yeah, the, the, some of them claim it's impossible. There are ayat that you know, contradict each other. No, they're not. You just, you don't know what you're talking about. You again, you don't know what you're, what you're doing. You're just lost in the middle of the surah. You don't know the self-evident uh, uh, statements that the surah made at the beginning. You don't understand the premise. You don't know, understand the context. You don't know when. And you're just, you know, and, you, and again, there's an agenda issue. There's always going to be an agenda issue. Um, I wanted to share that uh, just because I thought it was, uh, I forgot to do it last time. Uh, because ayah number seven looks like a very, you know, simple ayah uh, that's kind of, yeah, go ahead. So uh, usually things sometimes get taught in concepts, right? Yeah. Like topics or concepts. Yeah, yeah. Is there like such a book where, say, Tawbah or something, it, it collects all the ayat that's relevant to it? And I believe so. Uh, put it in context. So someone can get a whole idea of how yeah. Tawbah is explained in the book. Yeah, I don't know if it's yeah, I don't know I don't know if it's done th with that to that extent where it's looked at from all the from the concepts within the surahs itself. I don't know, but uh, I believe that there are collections uh, out there where they go through all the verses that talked about uh, about Tawbah, for example, for ex as a concept. I'm not very good with giving you examples, especially uh, English examples of it, uh, in English language. I don't know, but I'll look into it. 
and see and see what we can do. Uh, what I'm more interested in, see, it, 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 yani, again, the point of me saying all this, uh, what, what really interests me is for you to be able to learn to navigate a bit. Like when you're reading the Quran, to have some sense of, of direction, of knowing what's going on, knowing what to do and what not to do. It helps you, it helps you actually understand it with a bit more depth. See, this simple uh, concept that I've shared with you throughout the, uh, the, the years, of just how to look at the surahs and the concepts and the units. And the, when you do these things, uh, you're already like way ahead of you know, hundreds and thousands of other people that look at the Quran and don't know what they're doing at all. You know, you're just, just having that basic idea in the back of your, your mind that there has to be uh, 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 a line that connects all the verses. There has to be a, a you know a concept. There has to be a theme that's talking about. There has to be the the, the, the meanings have to uh, you know help each other or uh, you know b b uh, serve each other forward in in, in, in in drawing conclusions. Just looking at it like that, you're already you know, quite quite a bit ahead. Um, they didn't really need that long time ago because this is actually uh, pretty much uh, common sense for those who understand the language uh, clearly. Now, even even people who speak Arabic, they don't their their grasp of the Arabic language from a you know, linguistic and a, uh, and a creative perspective is very weak. We don't really and even those who speak the language they don't really do it very well. So when when you compare it, uh, people back then, this was kind of clear to them. They didn't really fall into these problems uh, because it was very it just came naturally. Uh, that's what this was saying, obviously. Uh, didn't you hear it? Like, I, we have to kind of talk about it and, and point it out. And for them, it was just, this is, what do you mean? Like, didn't, were you listening or <laughs> were you not paying attention to what the student was actually saying? For, for us, it doesn't, that's not how it resonates with us, which is fine because it's just, it's 1400 years later. And uh, the, the, you know, the, we, we don't, most people don't speak the, the language. It's not their first language. And even those whose first language, they never actually learned the language properly. Even when they went to school, like uh, they flanked Arabic uh, grammar like 10 times and they don't know, so they don't really understand how, how the whole thing works together. So it's not really, uh, so we've kind of, yeah, we've lost that. And that's why I bring it up. But the reason I bring these things up is because this is what's been lost. So when you ask me, is there, I don't know if there is or if there isn't out there, maybe, you know, that's what we should be doing. Maybe that's what we should be putting forward uh, and putting out there and, or studying first and understanding and gathering and looking at and then putting forward so people to take a look at. But, but if you look, I think you'll find. Like, I, I think there's a lot of people who are think, thinking down these lines or putting out material. Uh, I, I, I'm, I just, I'm not, I'm not up to date with it all. Okay. So that was just a little... Uh, something I want to share. So again, you have now you have a bunch of. So what are the, the self-evident concepts that the surah has already shared? Uh, gratitude has been one of them. Um, uh, the day of judgment and the fact that you should not be eluded, uh, you should not be fooled uh, by the worldly life. That shaitan is your is an enemy. He's out there, and that the consequence, whether uh, punishment or reward, is is awaiting you. So these are the five self-evident uh, concepts that the surah has put forward for you, right? And now, as the surah moves forward, it's going to kind of build on that slowly. It's going to build on it so it comes to conclusion so that you can actually feel. And that's why, that's the beauty of reading the, the surah, of, a surah of the Qur'an, that it kind of takes you through it. It walks you through, you know, doesn't come to the conclusion immediately. Uh, and that's why in the surah we always have an anchor, a, a verse. I always point out an anchor ayah. There's an ayah that the whole surah revolves around, right? Remember Surah Al-Hazab, huge, 10 pages. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنِ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ Right? It's number 36. Everything revolves around that ayah. The surah could have just come and said the ayah, and if you understand it properly, you took, <laughs> you took, but it needed to build up to it. You need to give examples, you need to comment on that so that it makes sense. But that's the anchor verse. Uh, and, the surah, and the Quran works differently with anchor verses. Sometimes you have more than one, sometimes just one, sometimes a build up to it, sometimes it's at the beginning and it's commentary. Sometimes the whole thing is building up to that one thing at the end. It depends. It does it differently. Surah al Fatir um, is different. It's, it's, yeah, it moves, it, it's a logical surah that takes step by step, kind of moves you forward moves you forward, giving you different uh, way of looking at things. But the climax is definitely towards the end. Okay, so we'll start with ayah number eight. Uh, we'll try to read maybe two or three ayat, inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Afaman zuyyina lahu su'u amalihi fara'ahu hasana Fa'inna allaha yudillu man yasha'u wa yahdi man yasha'u فَلَا تَذْهَبَ نَفْسُكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسَرَاتٍ 
الله عليم بما يصنعون so the verses that we're going to read uh, the, these two after uh, in a row are going to uh, uh, discuss a bit the concept of being fooled of uh, فَلَا the ayat that came uh, came on uh, n uh, number five so I tell you don't be fooled don't be eluded uh, don't let people don't let the dunya and don't let the shaitan show you what, what is not true there's a bit these two verses in a row that kind of just bring that uh, bring that concept home أَفَمَنْ زُيِّنَ لَهُ سُوءُ عَمَلِهِ فَرَآهُ حَسَنًا what about the person this is what I actually mean is saying and as for the person or what about the person who uh, the bad deeds su amalihi the, the deeds that weren't good that he that he performed the bad deeds that he performed zuyina lahu they were uh, 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 eluded to him or they were uh, uh, presented to him in a way faraahu hasana and that he saw them to be good right so what about the person who performed bad deeds, but they were presented to him, they were shown to him as if they were to be good, as if they were actually good. فَرَآهُ حَسَنًا What about that person? The, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the Prophet is what can you do for them? How can, you, how can you fix someone or help someone who is doing something wrong, but it appears to him that he's doing something right? Meaning they're making a mistake, but if you were to ask them, they think they're doing it right, how are you going to help someone like that? What can you do? Are you saying the concept? What, how, how do you change that? It's one of the most. See, if you look at people, there's different ways when it comes to knowledge and ignorance, right? There's this is what the, uh, one of the. I think it's. I'm not sure if it's Ibn Qayyim or it's Imam Al Haddad. I can't remember anymore who said this, but uh, this is what they said. What they said was is that people are four four types of people. There's a alim, yalam annahu yalam. There's a person who knows and he knows that he knows, and that's a scholar. Listen to them, take from them. That's someone you should go to because uh, they know something. They know they know it. Right? You can benefit from them. And then there are people who يعلم ولا يعلم أنه يعلم. They know, but they just don't know that they know. Meaning, you know, they, they, they're skilled at something, but they just, somehow they lost uh, you know, uh, connection with the fact that they're good at something. They stopped really educating and teaching and they stopped talking about it. And they're just kind of leading a, leading a regular life. But they actually have a lot to offer. So, وَهَذَا يعني غَافِلٌ يعني فَذَكِّرُوهُ وَخُذُوا عَنْهُ That's someone who يعني has lost his way or someone who's... Um, uh, a bit not, not concentrated or not concentrating so go and remind them and take from them and there's someone who is uh, who's ignorant and knows that he's ignorant and that's someone who doesn't know what he is yeah, he's uh, ignorant teach them they need help and then there's an ignorant person who doesn't know he's ignorant and that's an idiot so stay away from them because that's an imbecile there's nothing to do if they don't know and they're ignorant to their own ignorance, there's nothing, you can't fix that. That's, life is going to have to teach them the hard way. And then they have to come to a moment of self, uh, uh, truth, you know, uh, self-exploration where they're like, I don't know what I'm doing. And that usually happens late in life. Usually if you haven't achieved that by your mid-twenties, your next stop will be in your fifties before you actually get another chance to look at it, seriously. And then you'll live 25 years or 20 years where you're just, Everything you're doing is wrong. Now, I know people in their 60s and 70s who, who literally know nothing. Really, they could be evidenced by what they've achieved and what they were able to do, uh, but they still are totally uh, embraced in the, in the fact that they are the smartest person that ever walked the earth. And they just not given the opportunity or just everyone around them doesn't know what they're doing. And, and, and if, you, if you look around more, you'll find more of them and then you get really scared that maybe you're one of them <laughs> then you'll start and, and that, that's a good thing because then you start wondering a bit am i should i and you start watching and that's how you that's how you grow you make sure that you're not one of those people you're not someone who doesn't know what they're doing and thinks that they do what about the guy who is doing bad deeds but it's being presented to him zuyin zuyin is decorated and so it's decorated and it's made to look as if it's good and this person thinks, ah, I'm awesome, okay. everything I'm doing is right. No, I failed because, you know, it's, uh, yeah. the professor hates me. Yeah, I got fired because, you know, the, the boss is a racist. Or, and this, you know, he has no ability, has no self-insight, uh, has no ability to see his own shortcomings at all. Doesn't see himself uh, yeah, any mistaken in what he does. And that's, there's no, there's no cure for it. There's nothing, nothing you can do. It's a really scary, scary thing. I almost, um, uh, 
so when I explained to you the verse number five, I tried to explain to you why it's important. Like you need to have gratitude and need to have the ability not to be deluded. This is why. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking one step forward to explain to us this is why I don't want you to be deluded. Because if you are deluded and if you are uh, fooled, then this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to be someone living a life of sin, or living a life of, of failure, or of just, just of falsehood, but you don't have the ability to see that, and you think you're doing it right, but you're not. And it's not going to help you Yom Al-Qiyamah to come and say, well, I didn't know. That's not going to work. Your whole job is to self-regulate, and to develop insight, and to question yourself every step of the way and to take a step back and make sure make sure that you're not being fooled that you're not that you're not missing anything you have to use it, look at things with a critical eye especially when you're doing them especially when you're saying them always take a step back and say am I doing this right is it the right way is there a better way to do it is there anything else I can do that, to, to improve this or to change it and many people most people lack this to be honest most people lack this only, only the very you know, the very lucky Allah you know, or the very fortunate the people who are you know who, who make, a, make a point in their lives to do it I know I'm going to self-regulate, I'm going to develop my own insight, I'm going to you know, question myself and revise my approaches all the time. Why so you don't be this guy? So, there's a part of the, uh, of the sentence that's missing. So, afaman so, it's a question. Uh, as for the person who is, you know, uh, fooled by his bad deeds that uh, led to believe they're good, and that's the end of it, the sentence. The sentence is, the, the lead part is uh, uh, something that is understood. Uh, you can't do anything for them, Ya Rasulullah. There's nothing you can do. That's why, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُضِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ Indeed, Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala will you know, misguide who He wills and will guide who He wants or who He wills. And this can also be understood that Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala will misguide those who want misguidance and will guide those who want guidance or those who will uh, to be guided. Both, both understandings of the ayah are, 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 are completely acceptable. And then the ayah after the, uh, the part after فَلَا تَذْهَبَ نَفْسُكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسَرَاتِ May you not be in hasra, hasra uh, is, in, is sorrow uh, or a feeling of regret. So sorrow and regret, regret kind of put in together. Uh, sorrow, uh, huzun, and regret is nadam. Hasra is kind of something together, where you you feel sad and you're regretful. Why you regret? You feel sad that the person lost is lost, and you, feel, you regret that you didn't help them more. That's that's the idea. But at the nafsuka, don't uh, waste uh, waste yourself. Or don't um, go, to, don't uh, harm yourself. Don't don't cause harm to yourself uh, in sorrow and regret and remorse over these people, over over what they've done, or the fact that they've. Because, because when you see someone like that, uh, you know you feel like you, you, you can't reach them. Well, you feel like they they're so far away, even though they're sitting right beside you, but they just you can't. You, know, you see a, a Muslim brother or sister, and they don't pray or they don't believe and. And you can't, you, just, you don't know how, how do I get this across to you? That what you're doing is totally wrong. And they don't even feel, there's no guilt. If there's guilt, there's something there. Like if they feel like, yeah, yeah, I suck, I should be better. Well, at least, at least, you know, they have some, they, they've taken a step forward where they, they acknowledge that they're not doing it right. And that's someone you can help, right? But then the other group that doesn't see that, it's hard, it's hard to help them. It's almost impossible. In many senses, it's, uh, it's a waste of your time. You focus on those who have some, some form of insight and some form of self-regulation that we can actually help. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing of what they um so Yasna'un is an interesting word in the Quran. You don't find it in many places, it's only a few places. Uh, it's here. Uh, you find it again in the uh, in the verse that talks about Rabd al Basar. <laughs> The ayah that talks about you know shying away uh, with your gaze, not not looking at haram. So it's not all over the Quran. It's very specific places, and it usually refers to something. So sinaa is something that is uh, uh, that is complex in its in its uh, um, practice. Uh, amal is just a deed. You just did something. Fi'l uh, means it, um, uh, it's repetitive, it happens a lot. Uh, Sa'i means it's a long-term goal. Are you seeing the this is just differences in the Qur'an in terms of using the word. So amal is just, it is something. Fi'l is something you're doing all the time. Sa'i is what you're trying to achieve long-term, something that you have in your, your mind. Sina'a becomes complex, meaning there's, there's premeditation, there's thought, uh, you know, there's more than one thing going into this. It's not as simple. So whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to talk about something that is not simple, that is a bit more complicated in its nature of, 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 uh, of practice, He'll use the word yasna'un. That's when we talked about uh, lowering the gaze 
uh, when, when men lowering their gaze not looking uh, haram, he used the word yasna'un because it is a complicated issue. Meaning there's more to it than just doing it or not doing it. Uh, there's be times where you're speaking to a sister, so looking at her is not uh, haram at that moment. Then there's another moment while you're looking at her, it'll become haram because now you're thinking something else. So it's complicated. It's not just either you do it or you don't do it or you do it all the time. There's complexity. So when there's complexity, he'll use yasna'un. He'll use that word because then, yeah, this is sina'a. Sina'a is actually uh, the word we use for industry. Right, we're we're making something. So usually you're you're you know you're inventing something or you're you know um, what's a good word for it? Uh, manuf uh, manufacture. It's exactly. So you're, so you're manufacturing something. So here the word sina just means it has complexity. So in Allah alimun bima yasna. Indeed, Allah says all knowing of what they're brewing, like what they're doing and making the manufacture of what they're making. I know about it uh, because it's it's actually very complicated for you to get to the point where you're ignorant enough to be ignorant of your own ignorance and to continue like that, not being able to self-regulate. Yeah, that's, 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 a lot has happened. That doesn't happen like, you don't, you're not born like that. Just to make it, you're not born like that. Kids don't live like that. Teens don't live like that. Early 20s, you don't have that either. You have a critical eye, you know. But then you make a choice at some point where you stop doing it. And you, you stop self-regulating and blaming yourself and be, using a critical eye for the mistakes you make for long enough time that you get used to it. And, you, and, uh, and a switch happens in the way you, you live. You start trying something else. You start ad uh, administering blame upon others. You try that for a while. You find you're good at it. You have a good argument. You're strong. Right? You can get you can get people to you can convince people that it's other people's fault. It's not yours, and you like that. And then you find that you have the ability to actually convince yourself and turn off your conscience, so you don't you don't feel bad about doing that. It takes time. It takes a long time. So this is a huge sina. It takes a while, but that person you can't help. And that's a person who can't submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Period. That's why, understand why he said, Inna wa'ad Allahi haqq fala taghurrannakum Don't be eluded. Because if you are, if you're fooled, and you accept being fooled, and you're willfully ignorant about this, you're not, you can't submit. You can't. You have to be grateful. You have to be you know, aware of what is right and what is wrong uh, within your own actions and within life around you. And you can't be fooled. Or else you're not going to be able to do the simple you know, action of... of uh, it's not simple, but uh, the most important action, which is submission. Not able to do it. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Read the ayah after that, and then we'll stop. Wallahu alladhi arsal al-riyah. Wallahu alladhi arsal al-riyah. Fatufiru ila baladim mayit. Fatufiru bihi al-arda ba'da mawtiha. And then this ayah here, that's kind of like in the middle. Again, you think, well, why, what is this ayah doing here? Why is it here? It's just to explain the concept that was just talked about a moment ago about not being eluded. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the, uh, the winds, but to theal sahaba, it excites or it moves uh, uh, clouds. And this is taken over to a dead land, a land that has nothing alive in it. فَأَحْيَيْنَا Then of course it, uh, it uh, skips the point of, of rain coming on because that's understood. فَأَحْيَيْنَا بِهِ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ And then we grant life to a dead piece of earth after it's already gone. كَذَلِكَ النُّشُورِ And that's exactly how you're going to be resurrected. With that simplicity. So, uh, go back to ayah number 5. Just I want, to, I want to make sure that you guys understand this. Ayah number 5 said two things. It said, وَعَدَ اللَّهِ حَقْ The promise of Allah is truthful, that's resurrection. فَلَاتَغُرَّنَّكُمْ Don't be fooled. Right? So ayah number 8 and 9 came and explained those two concepts as commentary. Right? Number uh, 8 talks about don't being, not being fooled. How the fact that if you are deluded, that your bad deeds are good, then there's no hope and there's no point and don't waste your time with them. Allah knows what they're doing. They'll be them. And then the ayah number 9 talked about resurrection. And that if, if, you're, if you're questioning it, if you're not sure that it's, it could happen, or you're, you have, it's as simple as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending some winds, take some clouds, Water comes down and a dead piece of earth has life in it. Just the same, exactly the same. It's as simple as that. With really n just like a dead, earth, a, dead, a dead piece of earth is, a, is capable of, of generating life, when you're dead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will generate life from, from earth with you coming out of it. Just as simple. It's no big deal. The concept being that uh, uh, resurrection is everywhere around you. Everything is getting resurrected all the time. Why is it a big deal that you can't? Like everything is, uh, is dying and then being granted life and then dying again and then being granted life again. It's just happening all the time. Just how, 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 how the world works. Uh, what, why is it uh, something that can't happen to you? Why are you so yeah, any, uh, scared or, or um, 
uh, amazed you know, beyond your ability to believe that this, oh, it happened to me, it can't happen to me. Why it can't happen to you? This is how the world works. Everything is this is how it happens. They die and then we bring it and it comes up again and then dies again and then we resurrect it again and just how the world works. So Kadalik and Nushur, I mean, that's exactly how resurrection happens. Nushur is resur resurrection. Kadalik, it's like that. Very simple. So just, I, I'm trying to show you how the, how the ayat work in the Quran. So he gave you uh, uh, the, especially the ayah uh, number five that has a, um, a command that is a bit um, multifactorial. There's two things kind of coming together in it uh, to bring a concept. The ayat after that comment on it a bit to make sure that it delivers the idea. So what I'm explaining to you, tafsir, yeah, you're understanding it, but initially, the Sahaba would listen to this and this would make sense. Like, they wouldn't need the breakdown that I, you know, that I, so, because I get this a lot. Why, why don't we have books that talk about this? Why don't we have, it's really not, why, why does the, the Salaf talk about it? They didn't need to. They, they did not need to. There was no need. Why would they do this? Actually, if one of the Sahaba was sitting here, we'd feel this was the most biggest waste of time. The biggest waste of time for him. Like, what, what are you doing? You're stating the obvious. You're just explaining that water is water. And what do you do? You offer something. They'll be interested in the ahkam. They'll be interested in, okay, this is how we're supposed to behave. And this, uh, they're interested in the point of, of behavior and how that's going to affect, which is what we're supposed to do. But because we've lacked for so long conceptually, we haven't been able to understand why he's saying what he's saying and what he's trying to do with what he's saying and, and, does, and how it all connects. You know, we, we're failing the, the, the practical part. Like we're, we're failing that part completely. So I'm trying to go back and say, okay, this is, this is why he's saying this. It actually makes a lot of sense. It's, it's very well uh, structured. It's, it's very perfectly uh, put in line. It's bringing forward a very clear idea. Understand that? And then maybe you like you feel a bit more relaxed. Okay, this makes sense, and then we can start moving towards talking. Okay, this is this is how we're supposed to practice. But hopefully, we're we're, we're bringing that a bit of, bit of that up as well. Inshallah, within the halqa. But um, uh, that's that's the basic uh, you know, scope that we're looking at. Inshallah, I'll end. Uh, it's exactly nine o'clock. So uh, so we'll end with that. Inshallah, uh, we will be running the halqa. Inshallah, next week uh, as well. Um, uh, as I said, we're going to finish with Fatir, inshallah, and then maybe pause for a bit until we come up with a different, uh, uh, a different plan. Again, uh, for, uh, I wanted to kind of, uh, let's, let's turn it off. Let's, uh,